Well, well, like I said, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar on remote licensing hearings, essentials and best practice. Um, just to let you know that we are recording this session and the recording uh, will be available to view on the events section of the Cornerstone website. We've had an awful lot of registrations for this session, uh, so clearly it's a topic that resonates from Sunderland down to Southampton, even three years after remote hearings first began to feature in our working lives. And now, at last, the reason why we've gathered you today is to uh, discuss what we understand to be the first decision from the courts to discuss this issue. It's a case called Walk Safe Security Limited versus London Borough of Lewisham. Um, in the session, you'll be able to see I'm joined by my wonderful colleague, Joe Cannon. Um, I'll kick things off by taking you through the decision itself uh, before handing over to Joe to talk about best practice when it comes to running remote hearings, whether that's something you do already or are thinking about going back to in the wake of this decision. Um, questions, please uh, use the Q&A function. We'll pick up all the questions that you have at the end, including the ones, as I said, submitted in advance. Um, so this is our overview of the day. Now, before we um, look at the decision in any detail, I have to give a health warning, and I'm sure almost all of you will appreciate what, uh, why I say this. It's a decision of a district judge sitting in the magistrate's court considering one appeal. As such, it's not binding on any other case or any other authority. Uh, only a decision of the High Court has that legal effect. And the decision itself from that we're going to look at today could yet be overturned by the High Court because we're still within the period for appealing. The period, I believe the period for appealing expires on Monday. So as far as I know, um, no such appeal has been made, but one could well be made in that time. Um, so the background to the case, in a nutshell, is this. So Silks is a nightclub in Catford in South London. And as you can see from the headline, it encountered a few difficulties with its license. Uh, and that resulted in a series of hearings towards the end of last year before the London Borough of Lewisham Licensing Committee, uh, all of which, all of those hearings were held remotely using Microsoft Teams. And among the several decisions that were made uh, at those hearings was a decision to revoke the license. The premises license holder appealed um, and as well as seeking to challenge the council's decisions on its merits in a way that we're very, very familiar with as licensing uh, practitioners, it also raised a pure point of law, which was that the decisions were invalid because they were made following remote hearings and remote hearings, they said, were not permitted under either the Licensing Act 2003 or the Licensing Act Hearings Regulations 2005. Those regulations are quite important. I'm sure, again, you're all familiar with them. I'll call them the hearing regulations today. Now, that point of law was dealt with as a preliminary issue in the appeal, and it was heard by District Judge Abdul Syed in March, uh, well, yes, end of March this year, and she handed down her judgment in mid-April. That, of course, is the factual background. Uh, the legal background is that, uh, as again, as I'm sure you'll know, and Joe will talk about in a bit more detail in a bit, up until March 2020, few, if any, licensing hearings I expect had taken place anywhere other than in a council chamber or a committee meeting room. In other words, they'd always been held in person. And in March 2020, in response to the first lockdown, Parliament passed the local authorities and police and crime panels coronavirus, flexibility of local authority and police and crime panel meetings, England and Wales regulations 2020. You may remember, um, well, you, I'm sure you're familiar with them. You may remember Cornerstone did a series of webinars way back in March, April and May 2020 on what we called the flexibility regulations. Uh, and they enabled all local authority meetings to take place remotely. Uh, local authorities quickly adapted and a little over a year, a year later, in May 2021, Jackie Weaver is starring at the Brit Awards. But of course, by the time that Jackie uh, took her star turn at the Brits, remote meetings were actually a thing of the past because the High Court, in the case of Hertfordshire County Council versus Secretary of State, uh, held in April 2021, that when the flexibility regulations were due to expire, the, net the following month, May 2021, all local authority meetings needed to revert back to in-person meetings because they said the Local Government Act 1972 did not permit remote meetings. Now, central to the court's decision, and this is something that Joe, I think, will expand on later, was a concern that the 
Local Government Act 72 was silent on a number of important procedural questions about how meetings are conducted remotely, what constitutes a valid meeting. And that's important because significant decisions are being made um, as, a, as part of our system of local democracy. And it's important to have certainty about what is and is not a valid meeting and therefore a valid decision. Um, but importantly for our purposes today as licensing practitioners, the Hertfordshire decision said nothing about hearings taking place uh, before licensing committees. So you can, as you can see on the slide, there is a, an important distinction to be aware of here, that as a matter of law, an ordinary meeting of the local authority is not the same as a hearing before that local authority's licensing committee. And that's because a licensing committee is constituted under Section 6 of the Licensing Act 2003, and the 2003 Act gives that committee specific statutory functions, um, which it has to carry out on the Council's behalf. And that's, it, that's different to the usual system of delegating functions under the Local Government Acts 72 and 2002 various committees. So uh, licensing committee hearings are required to be held under various provisions of the Licensing Act 2003 and are conducted under the hearings regulations, whereas ordinary local meetings are called and held in accordance with sections 100A to I and Schedule 12 to the Local Government Act 72. So crucially, this meant, and it was accepted by both parties in, the, in, in this case, that the ruling in Hertfordshire did not apply to licensing hearings. And that meant it was an open question whether remote hearings were indeed permitted under the Licensing Act 2003 and hearings regulations. So two years after the flexibility regulations expired, almost to the day, um, their views differed as to whether remote hearings were lawful. Many authorities, including obviously Lewisham, uh, sorry, many authorities reverted to in-person hearings. Others like Lewisham continued to hold all of their hearings remotely. Some uh, adopted a half and half situation that some meetings would be in person, some remotely. Others again adopted hybrid meetings where some are physically in attendance and some are remote in attendance. And in the absence of a test case, it remained unclear as to what licensing authorities were and were not allowed to do. So that brings us to WalkSafe, uh, and which is, as I said, as far as we're aware, the only case in which the courts have been asked to formally provide an answer to this question are remote hearings allowed. So key to the appellant's case was uh, essentially three arguments. They said remote hearings are not lawful because um, the hearings regulations require a hearing to be held on a particular date and at a particular time and crucially a place. Place, they argued, self-evidently uh, describes a physical location. That was, their, that was their main argument there. And they said the right of parties and members to attend the hearing, uh, members of the public to attend the hearing, again, was an indication that physical attendance or physical presence at a specific geographic location was required. They also pointed to uh, amendments to the hearings regulations that had uh, occurred as a result of Welsh legislation. So the Welsh Senate had uh, uh, in 2021 expressly legislated for remote licensing hearings in Wales, and their argument was that that would not be necessary if remote hearings were already permitted under the Licensing Act 2003. And their final key point was that requiring hearings to take place in person provides greater certainty for everybody affected by the decision. And they pointed to the you know, significant consequences for not only license holders or applicants for licenses, but local residents and local communities, local economies uh, that follow from decisions in a licensing context. Now, in response, Lewisham's argument was that uh, remote hearings are lawful and there were really four key arguments that we made. Firstly, there was no definition of a hearing in either the 2003 Act or the hearings regulations. And so the submission was all that is required is a process in which uh, the committee or subcommittee hear evidence and submissions from all the parties and then they make their decision. Simple as that. And there's no reason in principle why that has to be done in person. And indeed, it's perfectly possible as hopefully we all experienced during that uh, period of time when the flexibility regulations were in place, 
it's perfectly possible to carry out a remote hearing in a way that is fair to all parties involved. The second point was that all the hearings regulations require is that the hearing, the hearing is held at a place. There's no further definition or qualification of that word. And therefore, in principle, uh, a place could be online or on a uh, online meeting platform. There was no uh, great difficulty, practical difficulty in arranging or, and giving notice of hearings taking place online. Again, as we learned in that 2020, 21 period. And crucially, this was in contrast to Schedule 12 to the LGA 1972, which did qualify the word place. And what, um, how, the, how Schedule 12 puts it is that local authority ordinary meetings need to be held at such place, either within or without their area. And the uh, court in Hertfordshire found that to be a very significant uh, feature of the legislation because it indicated that meetings needed to take place in a physical location. And again, Joe will come back to that point. The third point was that section nine, subsection three of the 2003 Act provides that subject to the basic procedural framework set out in the hearings regulations, that each licensing committee may regulate its own procedure. And therefore, we submitted it was open to the committee to decide as a matter of procedure to hold its hearing remotely. And um, importantly, because the licensing committee is part of a democratically elected body, the licensing committee has full democratic legitimacy to make the kind of procedural choices that the High Court in Hertfordshire had said that Parliament needed to make when it came to ordinary local meetings. The final key point that we made in, in the hearing was that the Welsh legislation, the significance of that was fairly limited. Although, yes, it had resulted in, in amendments to the hearings regulations themselves, the submission was that the Welsh legislation was enacted because it wasn't clear, it wasn't crystal clear from either the 2003 Act or the hearings regulations whether remote meetings, uh, remote hearings were permitted, uh, and therefore, to some extent, the um, all the legislation did was resolve that ambiguity by making it crystal clear, but also um, it could be said to represent a more centralised approach to regulating the conduct of remote hearings. We know that for the most part, licensing is a very local uh, regulatory area and a, a lot of uh, discretion is allowed to individual licensing authorities, reflecting their local circumstances and their local priorities to do licensing in its own way. And uh, the argument for Lewisham was that Parliament had decided not to take that centralised approach as they had in Wales. And it was up to local authorities to decide for themselves whether to go online or whether to remain in person, and if so, how that could be done. So what about the judgment? Well, the judge, District Judge Abdul Syed, essentially sided with Lewisham on those key points. The first key aspect of her decision was that um, uh, she held that whether a hearing is conducted in person or by remote means is a matter of procedure. Section 9, subsection 3 provides each licensing committee with the independence to make its own procedural decisions subject to the hearings regulations. And she went on to hold, as I put on the slide, the use of the word subject, i.e. subject to the hearings regulations, implies that unless the reg uh, regulations specifically permit or prohibit remote hearings, then the authority may determine the matter for themselves. So, in essence, it was a matter of procedure, as a matter of procedure, it was open to the licensing authority to decide for itself whether or not to hold a hearing remotely. The second key point of her judgment, the Hertfordshire case, not relevant, it's concerned with a different piece of legislation, the, 19th, the Local Government Act 72, um, but she did note a line in the Hertfordshire judgment, which again I put on the slide, where the court said that they could readily accept that meeting can in some contexts encompass virtual or remote meetings. Since March 2020, it's become common to refer to a Zoom meeting. And she relied on that as an indication that in a different legislative context, in a licensing act context, a hearing could encompass a virtual or a remote hearing. So the third point, on the significance of the Welsh legislation. She said that um, in Wales, they'd made express provision for remote hearings to clarify any ambiguity in the law. She did not accept the appellant's argument that this meant that before the Welsh legislation was enacted, remote hearings were not permissible. 
And she said, it's equally arguable that uh, the Welsh Assembly has simply sought to make clear and particular provision for remote hearings. It does not necessarily follow that the legislation applying in England prohibits remote hearings. The final key point from her judgment was that a place could be online. She noted that the word place is not defined in either the, the Act itself or the hearings regulations. And she said a place may be a physical location, but I see no, no reason why it cannot be a virtual platform, nor can I see any reason why attend cannot include electronic attendance. There's nothing within the language of the provisions which limits the scope of the word place as there is in the LGA 72. And in her conclusion to the judgment, she provided a neat summary, which I think is probably the main point to take away from the case, which is that since there's no prohibition on remote hearings, the London Borough of Lewisham, as she put it, is able to determine its own procedure. The remote conduct of a licensing hearing, she said, is permitted in law. So that's the judgment. As I said right at the beginning, the decision could still be appealed and it's not technically binding because it's a decision of the Magistrates Court. But unless and until a higher court says anything different, my advice would be that this decision can be used to support the continued use of remote hearings if that's the choice made by your authority. If you do choose to make that choice, there are a number of practical implications to consider. And with that, I will hand over to Joe. Thanks very, <clears throat> thanks very much, Matt. Um, sounds like you, you're also suffering slightly from a sore throat like I am. I'm gonna do my best. As you can see, I've got a glass of water, um, but my throat is um, not enjoying lengthy periods of speaking. So I'll keep this as, as brief as I can anyway. I'm gonna be about 15 minutes. If you just advance the, to the next slide, I'm gonna just talk about really um, building on what Matt said, obviously, Walksafe is his case, not mine. So he's the guy that really knows about this stuff. But I've had a bit of a think about what might flow from it and also a bit of stuff about the relationship between the Walksafe decision and the Hertfordshire County Council decision, which concerns local government act meetings. So I'm just going to reflect on that a bit with you all and, and try and um, pick up some of the key distinctions and look into the future and think, well, how best can we, um, as people who deal with licensing hearings, how best can we achieve certainty in the future. So as Matt said already, one of the key points of the Hertfordshire decision is this distinction between hearings and meetings. And I'm gonna to touch on that. Um, a bit of a spoiler here, where I'm gonna to get to at the end, and I think Matt and I both agree with this, and this is a key part of his case, Paul Lewis and in Walksafe, is that the answer for how can we avoid problems in the future for remote hearings is to have a protocol, to, to develop and publish a protocol for dealing with remote hearings to answer some of the uncertainties that are thrown up. So that's the that's the spoiler, that's where we're getting to as a kind of last sentence of our advice, if you like. And then um, I'm just gonna touch finally on some of the do's and don'ts of remote hearings and um, share a few horror stories, but also make a couple of points about the relevance of those sorts of stories to the legal questions that are at play uh, here. So if we, ne next slide, this is the Hertfordshire decision slide. Um, just a, a few points to make about it. Most of the points have already been made really by Matt. So the, the first point is that, just to put this all in context, the Hertfordshire decision is a decision of the divisional court. So it's binding as to the law and it wasn't appealed. So it's not going anywhere. Um, and, and it is, as, as we speak, the law on the question of meetings under the 72 Act. So local government meetings have to be in person. That's just, a, that's just the law. Now, you might, and I do, have views about how sensible that is. I was very sad to read that decision because I think it was a real, um, not necessarily a missed opportunity, but I'll say a bit more about the decision in due course. But but I think it would be really great to be able to have um, local government meetings on online. My view is that the move to online is inevitable at some point, and the sooner we embrace it, the better. But anyway, that's a sort of political view rather than anything else. So the, 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 the key two points about Hertfordshire, one is that it's binding. It's a decision of the divisional court. So it's a powerful um, decision, completely binding on, um, on us at the moment and isn't likely to be overturned anytime soon. The, the only way that it would change would be if the government legislated, as they have in uh, Wales and I think Scotland as well. Um, to be contrasted, as Matt said, with 
walk safe, which is, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, just a decision of the magistrates, so not legally binding in any way, probably persuasive, but um, only persuasive until a decision comes out saying something else or until somebody comes up with an answer to Matt's extremely persuasive points in his skeleton argument. Um, so, that, so that's Hertfordshire. And, and as Matt said, just the, the key points of the Hertfordshire decision, which is worth understanding in order to contrast with what WalkSafe tells us, First of all, is the distinction between meetings and hearings. So, as Matt's already said, that decision is, is of, of very narrow focus. It concerned itself with the question of whether meetings under the 72 Act could be held lawfully remotely. And so the judges looked in a very focused way and, in fact, said that they were doing so. They weren't defining the word meetings widely. They were just looking at the particular meaning of meetings under the 72 Act in the context of that piece of legislation. Uh, so that's to be contrasted, obviously, with, with what we're talking about in the Licensing Act, which is hearings. And as Matt said, they come from a different place. M meetings under the 72 Act are a particular species defined by this decision. Hearings are completely different. They don't rely on the 72 Act in terms of constitutional power. Uh, they arise from the Licensing Act and are to be defined and the meaning of uh, hearings is to be defined with reference to the Licensing Act in the same way. So there isn't really a crossover. And the judge in WalkSafe, although I think this is probably putting it slightly too high, was saying that Hertfordshire had no relevance to the question at hand in WalkSafe. I, I think it probably does have relevance. And I think you probably want to be looking at the key distinctions between meetings and hearings in order to distinguish Hertfordshire. Anyway, she said no relevance. I think what she meant was it was answering a different question and therefore doesn't is not determinative of this question with which I agree, but no relevance seems a bit high to me. And it seems to me, as, as Matt's already said, really, that the key, there are really two key reasons why the judges in Hertfordshire decided what they did about local government meetings. One was the words with, and this is about arranging the meeting, that they should be held at a place within or without their area. Now, you remember that Matt said that in the, in the judgment in Hertfordshire, it was recognised explicitly that place could mean, the meaning of place could include a remote place, a, a platform or a, a Zoom meeting or whatever. Um, but it was the words that followed that the meeting should be held within or without their area that led the judges, I think, to say, well, in that case, that means a physical location. Now, you know, for what it's worth, my view is that's quite a flimsy basis for um, for the finding, which is quite a you know, uh, a finding with quite a lot of ramifications. That doesn't feel to me to be a kind of slam dunk. But anyway, that's what the judges alighted on. Um, and so that's at the heart of the Hertfordshire decision. And of course, those words don't appear in the Licensing Act at all. So a key distinction, which Matt obviously exploited properly in, in WalkSafe, was to say, well, there aren't any words of that nature limiting the or, or qualifying the uh, definition of hearing rather than meeting, but nonetheless... Um, and so nothing to denote physical attendance or, or, or place being a physical idea. Um, but the other point that comes out of Harvardshire, which I think is perhaps more important in terms of future ramifications and, and for licensing, was that the judges were, what they were asking themselves, and I don't want to get into the detail of this because it could take a whole seminar of its own. Obviously, the Local Government Act was made in 1972, enacted long before we knew anything about remote hearings or anything of that nature. So um, there's a sort of doctrine of uh, looking at old legislation and asking, can they be read in a way that encompasses future development? So, for example, I've been busy in the last couple of years dealing with um, taxi licensing legislation. That's all very old um, and in, in private hire terms, both of which the London one and the outside of London one were enacted long before we knew about taxi apps. And so in trying to construe that legislation, we've got to ask ourselves, well, can you can you construe the legislation drafted before contemplation of technolo technological advances in a way that encompasses those technological advances? And to some extent, that was what's going on here in Hertfordshire. Can, can the legislation from 72 be read in a way to encompass what we now know in 2002, as it was, or one as it was, um, about remote hearing, an idea that was completely alien in 1972 when it was drafted. And that 
um, discussion kind of homed in on answering particular questions about how you run meetings. So the, the need for certainty about certain things. How do you attend a meeting if it's remote? How do you vote at a meeting if it's remote? And none of those things, I mean, perhaps unsurprisingly, were answered by the legislation. And that led the judges to say, well, we're not able really to say that that encompassed or envisaged changes in technology in the future, i.e. now, um, which, which allowed the the definition of meeting and place to encompass a remote place. So there were all these kind of unanswered questions. Well, what about attending? You know, can you attend by phone only? Do you have to have your, all of those things were left at large. And that led the judges, I think, in quite a kind of um, pr pragmatic, I suppose, although I actually think it's the opposite approach to say, well, no, this is a narrow definition of meeting and it has to be physical. Yeah. So, so those are the sort of key points that come out of Hertfordshire, I think. So if we just go to the next slide, Matt, if you wouldn't mind. Um, <laughs> maybe we could try again. Um, the walk safe decision was, was brought, and I actually haven't checked to see whether he's here, but by a, a licensing solicitor who is, it's fair to say, not afraid of having another go when he's had a defeat. So somebody who is a tenacious challenger of the status quo and, and I respect him for that but nonetheless I, I think just because he's come up against Matt Lewin in Lewisham and lost doesn't mean that he'll now slink away and think well that point's decided we're not going to run that one again I, I suspect it, it might come up again and because of what I said earlier about it being not binding um, all we need is a different magistrate's court constituted differently to come up with a different decision and then we've got a problem we've got two decisions and we've got a, the question is at large again so how do we avoid that if we're interested in avoiding that as local authorities? Now, I recognise not all of you are local authorities and those of you who might be thinking about bringing a further challenge, this is just as helpful, I hope, for you as it is for local authorities. Um, what are likely to be the questions that determine it? Well, in, in my view, and also in Matt's, because it was, I think, how he won it in Lewisham, if I may say so, um, absolutely central to the walk safe decision is the difference with Hertfordshire that's comprised in Regulation 9.3, which is the specific power in the Licensing Act and the regulations made under it for a licensing committee to regulate its own procedure. So all of those, the sort of fourth um, balloon in the previous slide, which was need for certainty, that's answered by the power in Regulation 9.3 of the hearings regs, which says, all of those questions are answered by the local authority who can decide how these things run. And that includes, well, first of all, the question of remote or non-remote, but also all the subsequent questions about how, how will attendance be managed, voting, decision making, all of that. So um, if what we can't do anything about is the is the words, the within or without their area, the definitions and so on. But what we can do is look at the kind of practical element of the Hertfordshire approach, which is what about certainty and, and head off questions of uncertainty that might arise from remote, remote hearings by regulating the procedure and being clear about it, making clear what the choices and arrangements are. And in doing so also making contingency plans for when things go wrong. Um, and so, if there's another challenge, I think that's likely to be where it, where it will be won and lost, not on the wording, because I don't think wording says an awful lot, um, but on the practical uh, removal of mischief, if you like, in lawyers' terms of saying, well, look, here's how we, here's how we answer all the questions about our remote, ide remote hearings a good idea, or are they problematic? And if you can show a judge or a magistrate's court that they're not problematic, then I think you'll be two thirds of the way to getting it along armed with the walk safe decision to getting remote hearings found to be lawful again if, if they're challenged. So how do we do that? Do you want to just click onto the next slide, Matt? Um, as I said in my spoiler, the, the answer is um, a, a protocol, is to develop a, a protocol for remote hearings. We think that there's quite a wide variation, variance in what people are doing. Um, in, in terms of running remote hearings. I've done lots of remote hearings, both for and against, if you like, in front of local authorities, but I know that lots are holding them in person. In fact, I'm doing one in person tomorrow at Westminster. 
Um, so I think there is quite a um, quite a, a variation in in what people are doing. And nothing in this seminar is supposed to say that either of the things are, are good or or bad. Although my view is that having the ability to do it remotely is a positive thing, as you can probably tell. So that's good. You're you're all busy voting on that. So I'll I'll carry on while you do that um, with with this slide. Uh, basically, the, the advice is or the the recommendation is to, as Lewisham did, draw up a protocol for running remote hearings, just in the same way as everyone did when, or most local authorities did when they were running licensing hearings for the first time back in 2005. You, you drew up with having regard to the hearings regs, a kind of protocol for running hearings, and they still get read out, sent out today. You just need exactly the same thing for remote hearings, but which is focused on the particular issues that remote hearings throw up. And, and for me, you can distill that into sort of five areas. It may be that Matt's got some to add. And, and um, one of the features, as you've heard of WalkSafe, is that Lewisham very sensibly published or produced a protocol, which they then put in evidence in front of the magistrate's court and said, in effect, look, if remote hearings are lawful, we'll adopt this protocol and this is how we'll run them going forward. So given that they won, I suspect this is now either in force or about to come into force. So the five areas that I think that a re remote hearing protocol needs to cover, they're not the only five, but they're, I think, essential. First, and sort of going clockwise around the screen, first of all, how do members attend? So how do, how do the members of the subcommittee attend? Do they have to be on video? Do, you know, what are the options? My view is that they probably do need to be on video and they should all be attending in the same way. So you probably shouldn't have one on the phone and... Um, and I think it's important for them to be visible for reasons I'm going to come to in the horror stories section of the of the talk. But you, that's just my view, and that's not a legal view. Um, but a protocol should deal with that. How can a member attend? Um, then you've got removal. So what about if someone is disruptive or puts up pictures of inappropriate things, as has happened in the past, or... Um, or their sound, not through any fault of their own, their sound is so problematic that um, it's actually very disruptive. Or, you know, there are a hundred ways in which people might need to be removed. And you know that in the hearings regs, there is a specific power to remove a member of the public, um, which you need to manage in the remote space. So again, your protocol will need to deal with how that happens and how that person can be told that they're being removed and how they can be re apply to be readmitted, so on and so forth. None of this is supposed to be detailed advice about what the protocol should say, but it should you should be thinking about these issues, managing the hearing, how, how will that work? Even the use of mute, the mute button, because that's a very powerful tool, but it also has, well, part of being very powerful is that it has quite important ramifications. So if you are muting somebody, if, if you as the chair of the um, meeting, or hearing rather, well, I should get that right, shouldn't I? Hearing is um is has the power to mute a speaker. What you're really doing is excluding them from speaking at the hearing, and that's potentially problematic if you haven't got a protocol saying in what circumstances you can and can't do that. Same for removal. It also obviously needs to deal with access to the public. Now, by the public, I, I mean people who are not participating in the hearing. Now, what normally happens is that these are kind of live streamed um, on the internet in some way, and people can attend without participating by watching the, the feed, the live feed of it, and that's broadly fine, and I haven't heard much complaint about that. But again, the protocol needs to deal with how people apply to do that, how they get their link, so on and so forth. Can they phone in and listen rather than have to be on the Zoom or Teams or whatever it is? Uh, fourthly, it needs to deal with attendance by the parties. So ha same questions, but it's slightly different focus. How do the particular parties, the applicant, the people making representations, the responsible authorities, so on and so forth, how do they attend? And then for all of those, you also need to, be, or the protocol needs to be thinking about what happens when technical things go wrong, if somebody's sound drops out or if their internet connection drops out? Because obviously, if one of the three subcommittee members loses the connection for any material part of the hearing, you've got a problem because all three need to be there the whole time. The same for one of the parties. I, I had a, a remote hearing a couple of years ago where um, the applicant actually lost their internet 
and it was very difficult. They they weren't able, of course, they dropped out in the middle of the, I was legal advising, in the middle of the police evidence, I think, and they weren't able to really tell us. So I think 10 or 15 minutes went by before they were able to tell us that they dropped out. And we had to kind of rerun that bit of the hearing, which was awkward, and we didn't really have a protocol for it. And it meant the police kind of rerunning their submissions so that the applicant could hear. So if we'd had a protocol, it probably would have said do exactly that. But these are the problems that could arise that don't arise in uh, in person hearings, but just need to be dealt with. And then lastly, at the end of the hearing, there's usually a different um, approach, isn't there? Um, first of all, well, not necessarily at the end, if the legal advisor wants to give advice, there's a provision for doing so in private session in the hearings. Right? So how do you manage that in a, in a um, Teams or a Zoom meeting? Well, it's not impossible. You can go into a breakout room. There's various, you can adjourn the hearing briefly. But you, again, the protocol ought to say how that's going to be dealt with. And, and make clear. And then the same with deliberation and the delivery of a decision. So normally what happens in, a, um, in an in-person hearing is that deliberation happens in private session, the members file out, the legal advisor goes with them, they deliberate, everyone waits. You need to manage that in the virtual space. Now, my view for that one is that actually there's a lot to be said for ending the hearing at the point where deliberation is about to start members of the public parties can go away, go about their business. Members can then deliberate at some point. They've got five days to do that. So they can deliberate at some point, come up with their decision and provide it to the parties in writing, rather than making everybody wait remotely for a decision while they deliberate in a breakout room. But it's not vital that you do that. And of course, there's at least one council that I think still does their deliberation in public. Um, you might have views, I do, about that, but nonetheless, they're pretty clear that that's what they... Think is the right way to do it so again that would need to be managed by way of this of this protocol um so all all of those points there's no hard and fast answers to any of these but the point is that a protocol can deal with them all and and tell the public what the arrangements are and if there's then a challenge that's the kind of thing just as happened in lewisham that you could wave in front of a magistrate's court and say look the, the questions are all answered by this protocol there isn't any uncertainty here um, contra Hertfordshire and the concerns of the Divisional Court in Hertfordshire. Okay, ne next slide briefly, ho horror stories. I mean, one of the features in um, WalkSafe was that the appellant put, it, put in or relied on, for the reasons I don't fully understand, some sort of stories of, of remote hearings going wrong or, or attracting criticism or, or problems arising. So in their skeleton, they referred to three headlines in newspapers of like remote hearings, about, not necessarily hearings, but remote things going wrong. One of them was a, a councillor was knitting during a, a, a remote hearing. Um, one of them tuned in while driving, so kind of attended while driving. Probably not a great idea. And another one was caught swearing. I mean, you know, that that's not, to me, that seems nothing to do with remote, but that could happen e either way. But there are lots, aren't there? I mean, we've all done a hearing where, well, perhaps we have. I've certainly done a hearing where pets have wandered across the screen. Now that's that's all right. And, you know, to me, that adds a sort of slightly human factor. But you don't want a full view of um, one of the members' cats um, while you're trying to persuade them. Um, obviously, there's the perennial problems of, of being on mute or not being on mute, as the case may be. Um, camera views can be problematic we've got a colleague in chambers who has a fairly eccentric approach to camera angles when he joins chambers meetings so we have a rather more intimate knowledge of the inside of his nostrils than we perhaps well at least than I wanted I don't know about Matt um, and so on I mean there, there are hundreds of stories of of where remote hearings have given rise to problems that we would rather not give rise to but um, my point about that is that none of them are really relevant to the question of the legalities of running a remote hearing. And actually, there have been horror stories about licensing hearings for years. This is a slide that I've delivered for at least the last six years um, when training council, li li licensing committee members, councillors on running good hearings. Now, I made this slide, I think, for the first time in 2017. All of those points are like, don't do this points all of it before the pandemic, before we did anything remote. And they're all problematic. You know, they're all things that you shouldn't do. Um, and they're all things that happened, some of them to, to me. So my point is, of course, there are things that you must avoid in a remote hearing. And I think that it's right to say that there's a temptation 
when attending remotely to be less formal than you might in person. Um, but that's just dealt with by good protocols and training and good advice. That, that None of those go, in my view, to whether you should or shouldn't run remote hearings. They're just a matter of management, really, just as they were before we knew about remote hearings, where we had to tell our members all, all the things that I've put on that list. Don't, don't do any of these uh, things. So for me, there isn't really anything in the point about, well, look at all these things that happened. Aren't they funny in remote hearings? Yeah, they were funny at the time and, and you know, in a pretty bleak time being able to see up people's nostrils and seeing their cats walk across screens made us smile. But for me, they just don't go to the, to the question here, which is should we run hearings remotely or, or not? So I think, Matt, that's that's more or less me. I've probably gone a little bit over, over time. Um, I can see that there's, there's a, one question in the Q&A for which, um, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's always a slightly difficult one to pronounce. Mrinalini, Raja Ratnam, forgive me if I've got that wrong. Um, if a hearing is adjourned to another date, should the resumed hearing be chaired by the same person? I mean, the answer is yes, wh whether remote or not remote. Um, you've got to keep the same um, subcommittee. The only caveat to that would be if, if you opened a, and this does sometimes happen, you open a hearing and before any evidence is heard or you get into any of it, there's an issue, someone's not well or whatever, um, and the subcommittee decide that the appropriate course is to adjourn at that point. So before anything's happened of substance, then I don't think you need the same subcommittee next time. You can, you, let alone the same chair. It could be a totally newly constituted. But once you've got into hearing any of the of the case, you know, any of the points, then you need the same, um, the, the the same subcommittee basically, um, and and almost certainly the same chair. I mean. I think strictly you don't need it to be the same chair. I'm not sure of a rule that says the chair has to be the same person, but I can't really see why you would change the chair in that in those circumstances, um, unless they weren't there, in which case you've got a problem. Um, Matt, anything to add on that? And that we've had another one from Stuart Broom. Oh, they're all coming in now. Here, here we go. I'm going to hand over to Matt. Um, so I just wanted to add two things to Joe's um, uh, practical points, which I think would also be worth covering one is the question of wh when do you when do hearings go remote and when do they go in person and you might have a default rule that all hearings are remote unless the party requests or unless the party shows good reason or it might be the other way around so i think that that would be sensible to cover and what was the other one oh, i can't remember the other one but that's probably a, an important point to make um we've got a question from stuart does this decision apply to gambling act 2005 hearings and i think a similar one from Saima, what about uh, street trading applications? Um, would that have to be in person? I think the honest answer is I don't know for sure off the top of my head, um, but I would imagine if there's something which there may well be in the Gambling Act, uh, along similar to Section 9.3 of the Licensing Act, the, the subcommittee that the committee is allowed to regulate its own procedure, then yes, I think it would. Um, the London Local Authorities Act, well, much older piece of legislation, I don't know whether it would have, it wouldn't have a similar provision but they could well be held remotely I don't know if you've got a view on that Joe. Um, well I think the strict answer is is no the decision doesn't apply to those because well certainly the first of those the gambling act because you don't run gambling act hearings under the licensing act 2003 as I understand it so strictly no but it's likely to be highly persuasive because I think the provisions are very similar but again I off the top of my head I, I'd have to look at it to see quite how um, that that all works. Um, in terms of a street trading application, I, again, not something I've looked at recently, but I think it's right that that would be a license, that would be a function of the licensing committee. So it might well uh, fall under the aegis of the of the hearings regulations, but you'd have to have a look. But I think generally the approach would be to treat walk safe <laughs> with the caution that Matt's already said about it being a magistrate's court decision, not binding, etc. But also as being really limited to the particular facts, just as Hertfordshire. So I, I don't think you can assume that it would be applied um, exactly as we understand it for the Licensing Act hearings to other kinds of hearings. You'd have to have a look to see whether what's said by the judge in that case is, is applicable across to another regime. Yeah, I, I think the key distinction is whether it's a, a, it's a meet. I think, Joe, you made this point, so sorry if I'm repeating. I think the key distinction is whether it's a meeting called under the 72 Act, in which case it has to be in person. That's what Hertfordshire tells us. 
if it's under other legislation, then it's possible that um, that it could be held remotely. We've got a question from Michael. If a hearing is arranged virtually and the applicant then asks for in person, but not all members can attend in person, can a meeting be held beyond the traditional time in which a hearing is required to enable a new membership to be secured? I think my answer would be no. Um, the time, yeah. is time limits. Mine too. I, the, the remoteness doesn't. Or, I mean, you, the only thing is that there is a there's an in the public interest ability to extend time, isn't there? Um, so it might be that if you could make a powerful case that um, natural justice required it, that you might be able to extend the, the time, or, or you could open the hearing and then adjourn, which is yeah. another way that you can, yeah. could do it. Well, so not not situation. impossible. Yeah, I might be a situation where you try a hybrid meeting where some are in person and some not. OK, um, Alan, how to ensure a fair hearing remotely within the principles of natural justice? How to ensure all members of the committee are fully concentrating at all times? Well, you, if you've got an answer to that, I'd like to know. <laughs> I mean, the, the basic answer is that you can't, but nor could you with um, council meetings or, or licensing out hearing. You know, that you can tell members not to text on their phone under the... I mean, I, you know, as you might remember from the slide, a couple of slides back, I went once went years and years ago, went to a full licensing committee, public entertainment licence committee in um, a London borough, and they listened carefully to the police objection to my application. And then they said to me, the chair said to me, it's your turn, Mr. Cannon, the floor is yours. Um, and while you make your submissions, I'm just going to go next door and make a coffee. Is that all right? <laughs> this is the chair of the committee, to which my answer was, if you don't mind, let's adjourn. But the, the, I think the point for Alan is that, you know, we need to work out ways of ensuring that members take their responsibility seriously, whether it's remote or not. And I think it is probably slightly more difficult remotely, but um, it's a question of management, not a question of um, principle, I, I would say. I don't know if you've got anything to add, Matt. Oh, I, no, I agree with that. It's partly for the chair, isn't it, to keep an eye on their colleagues. And but I think mostly you're relying on the good faith of members. If you as long as you've ensured that you've got a proper protocol in place and all the parties have the same opportunities to make their case, I don't think you can really uh, uh, legislate for what members actually do unless you make them share their screens in case they've um, their searches for tractors go awry. Uh, and then you can and then you can monitor that. Um, Shapriya asks, if you can't get same members, then would it need to be a new hearing? I think we've answered that one, haven't we? David, what happens if you adjourn a part heard hearing for any reason? Then there's an election and some of all members do not get voted back in. Um, that's, a, that's a good one. I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it seems to me that that arises remote or in person. Um, yeah. I, I suspect that the answer is you probably shouldn't adjourn. <laughs> and part heard if there's an election coming up um but i realize I, I suspect that you're probably going to want for safety to start a new hearing abandon the one that you adjourned part heard and start yeah. again yeah okay robert asks if at some point in the future remote hearings are held by the harcourt to be unlawful are the validity of past decisions susceptible to challenge what are the risks to local authorities um i would say not i think there's a tricky one but the general rule is that acts of all public authorities are assumed to be valid unless and until they're held to be invalid. And I think if the local, if the High Court held in the future that, rem that a remote hearing had been unlawful, I don't think that would necessarily undo what had happened before. And certainly you'd have a strong argument if you were on the receiving end of a judicial review to say, well, what difference did it make? You'd have a Section 31 uh, defence under the Senior Courts Act. So I would not worry too much about that. I think would be my kind of headline advice on it. If you want, if you want to conduct remote hearings and you have good reasons for doing that, then go ahead. But obviously, if there are new developments, we will of course update you. But I don't think I don't think that would unwind past. No, I, I, I totally agree. There's a thing called the um, either the principle or the presumption of regularity, right. which says that decisions that are made pursuant to a law at the time properly are presumed to be fine, even if that law is subsequently shown to be, to be undone. It's a bit more complex than that, but the, 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 base, the starting point is that that would be fine um, and it would only be prospective, the, the, the change in, in the law. So I, I, it, I mean, apart from anything, it would be completely impractical to invalidate all of the, I mean, there are hundreds of these things going on every week. So um, yeah. I can't for a minute think that that would be an issue. Yeah. Um, Leah says, everything that has been said about remote hearings, does that, also applied to hybrid hearings? I think the answer is yes. Um, what about licensing committee meetings rather than hearings? 
um, we take the view that they are not ordinary committee meetings under the 72 Act and therefore could be held remotely. I don't, well, I think maybe we've got a difference of opinion here, Joe. You, you're nodding. Well, I think the, the that's the right question, is yes. look, look at the source of the power to hold the meeting. I, I would need to look at the legislation properly. Um, well, my, headline, my headline response is that's an ordinary meeting under the 72 Act, so it would have to be um, in person because it's not... It's not a hearing. Uh, I think that's a, that's the key distinction. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly the the distinction between meetings and hearings is 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 highly important. So if you're straying into the world, you know, the great thing about licensing act hearings is that they're a different species. You can point to the name; it's different. Yeah. If you're then talking about meetings, I think you're you're sailing much closer to Hertfordshire, and you'd need to be able to be pretty confident. And without looking at it, I can't give a clear answer. Yeah as to whether that meeting would be covered by the Hertfordshire decision, but be much more likely to be covered by Hertfordshire, even if not directly, by analogy, because the fact that it's a meeting, not a hearing, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll leave the last two questions to you, Joe. but um, just R Robert's question has reminded me the second thing I wanted to add to your uh, your points about the protocol is that you you might already, you probably already have one, because when councils adopted emergency or temporary standing orders under the flexibility regulations all of the stuff that joe was talking about should have been covered you know what constitutes attendance etc so with for lewisham what we did was we essentially copied and pasted the text that had been inserted into the standing orders and changed it a little bit so it fitted the licensing context but we didn't have to do any kind of radical or very demanding new work the, the material was already there so that was my other practical point i wanted to mention Thanks, Matt. Um, the, the last two questions. Oh, hang on, there's more now. Um, th there's an interesting one from Robert Brown, which says, um, presumably each local authority will still be bound by its own standing orders. For example, I don't know which authority, but their council procedure rules, which apply to subcommittee hearings, provide for decisions to be made by a majority of members present in the room. The question would this phrase rule out remote hearings? It's a good question. I mean, the first point is that you can change your council procedure rules if they don't suit you. Um, and the second point is, you know, there might be an argument, it's more difficult, but there might be an argument to say that in the room can be construed properly to mean whether that is a Zoom room or a or a physical room. And, and any ambiguity about that could be fixed by changing your standing orders, which is not a particularly, sorry, your procedure rules, which is not a particularly onerous approach so if you if you wanted to run remote hearings and felt that that was a potential obstacle to doing so then i think the route to changing that would, would be relatively straightforward M matt jump in if you if you disagree no, i agree i think that does add an, an, a layer of complexity that we didn't have in the lewisham case um and obviously decisions have to be taken in accordance with standing orders and they would be liable to be quashed if not but um mm -hmm. i think you could probably construe room as being a, a, a virtual room but as joe said change it <laughs> to make it clear I think that's a good idea um Ben hello Ben I haven't heard from you for a while um Ben actual says surely this and I think this might well be right surely the distinction is between local authority meetings and licensing authority meetings being distinct I mean I think that's one of the routes that you would want to explore is what is whether a meeting of the licensing committee as part of the licensing authority was a meeting caught by the 1972 act but but I think my point stands which is that even if it wasn't constitutionally you'd want to be very careful that um the the reasoning in the Hertfordshire case that didn't apply across and it would be harder to be confident about that because of the word meeting rather than than hearing and then martin hello martin um we've lucky enough to know your middle names today um <laughs> excellent news says what about licensing act meetings for example a summary review mm, good question i haven't thought about that um so in my view, a summary review is not a meeting, it's a hearing, um, because uh, it's listed in the, among the various triggers for a hearing before the licensing committee in the Act, and then it's dealt with under the reg, uh, hearing, uh, summary review hearing is dealt with under the hearings reg, so my view would be that's a hearing, and therefore could be done remotely. Um, Matt, the last one might be for you, and I think it probably should be the last one given the time. Um, it's, it's Ben again, uh, Ben Atrell. Was any consideration given in the case 
to su same sort of point to yeah. summary review guidance indicating pre-COVID that interim hearings can be remote, mentioning via telephone. I think that's actually that bit of the guidance is actually about the, the decision as to whether to impose interim steps, isn't it? That that yeah. could be done by telephone. And that's not a, specifically not a hearing. I think that's a decision, and then you have to hold a hearing if the license holder makes representations against the interim steps. Yeah, but exactly. Matt, I'll, I'll let you answer. No, Joe, you're right, and it, this was an issue in the case. It did it did come up and. My answer was that I think, and I think as Joe has said, that where the guidance refers to an in without the need for a hearing, that reflects long-standing practice where you do whatever you can to get your your quorum together to make a quick decision on interim steps within was it forty eight hours you've got to make it I think, um, and so traditionally you don't hold a hearing. Some authorities do, but you don't need to under the Licensing Act. So um, that to me wasn't an indication that a hearing uh had to be held in person that was just referring to the very un very specific situation where you receive a summary review application and you need to act very quickly uh, and informally to make a decision on interim steps yeah that, that makes sense to me and um, just one last one sorry um your, yours has come a bit too late but anthony lenahan says and i think it's worth answering this would any issue arise with jurisdiction for key participant took part remotely outside of england and wales N not in, in my view i mean first of all there's i don't think there's a jurisdictional issue anyway um but i think if you attend remotely then where you are physically is is not the relevant question it would be would be my point I mean, the whole point about remote attendance is that your physical presence is not is not the point but matt i don't know if you thought about that totally agree totally agree um yeah i mean have you ever been at a remote hearing where someone asks where are you dialing in from usually it's are you in a quiet location that's the probably the more important question absolutely and i, I just just a last uh point um which might be helpful i did a um an injunct totally did nothing to do with licensing about two months ago i did an injunction hearing in the high court and um it was so po post covid it was a live hearing i was in court with the judge but it, we were trying to get an injunction against multiple parties who owned parts of a piece of land in the south downs and we agreed to a hybrid hearing and those I had two hearings and both times the judges were extremely flexible about how the defendants attended and some of them attended while while in a car some one of them was walking on the piece of land with it, which it was concerned you know on his phone and so on and the judges were completely unconcerned I think impressively with that stuff as long as the judge could hear them and they could hear the judge in each case and it wasn't too distracting then two high court judges seemed unconcerned about the constitutional legal implications of where they were attending from and as long as she in one case and he in the next case could see them and hear them and vice versa then it wasn't a problem and, and we got the injunction and it was a hybrid hearing some people attended and and so you know if high court judges are unconcerned about that kind of stuff I'd be surprised if that was an issue in licensing. So just before we finish, thank you to everyone who asked questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I hope that's been helpful. Um, as we said at the beginning, the materials, the slides and this recording uh, will be available on our website. If you've got any more questions, I think I think we would encourage those. We'd also obviously encourage instructions sent through to our clerks uh, on any similar or any licensing matter at all. Um, thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah. Nice to see you all.